Hey there, Mr. Robinson. Hey there, Mr. Smith. What is our program about today? We have a question. Does Jesus' statement that we are to be the salt of the earth, which would make us a preservative agent, mean that we should vote in election? Ooh, yeah. That sounds pretty good. Let's talk about it. Thank you, Jake and Julia. We appreciate that. And, you know, I should highlight, they don't actually come here and sing that live every time we do this podcast. They they did it once and we use a recording. Yeah, that would be distracting. That would be very distracting. And they'd be bored just sitting there the rest of the time while, while we're talking, waiting to sing their wonderful little bit at the end. A uh, quick housekeeping before we jump into the question today. We want to thank everyone who's been listening for your patience. We know our sound quality is not the best. I am doing my best to commit myself. Mr. Robinson is watching to make sure I don't turn my chair and hit the desk. We think that's been one problem. But it's really just been this little blue Yeti mic uh, on the desk and, and us in a room with nothing else. And our uh, disclaimer guy, whom we appreciate very much, happens to be a tech genius. And he's going to stop by next week and we're going to experiment with some uh, some uh, microphones and such that he has. And so we're looking forward to that. But we thank you for your patience. And uh, I've, been, I've, I've been told that people will forgive bad video quicker than they'll forgive bad sound. Uh, I think Mr. Robinson would agree. All right. Today's podcast focuses on a question. This question has been floating around amongst uh, young individuals in God's church. And in this particular environment, I, I'll be up front. I, I can understand why. I can understand the temptations that this question represents. Uh, Mr. Robinson, what was that question again? Does Jesus' statement that we are to be the salt of the earth, which would make us a preservative agent, mean that we should vote in elections? So, since we're supposed to be the salt of the earth, should we vote in elections? That seems to be rooted in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, and there's parallel verses in other places. Matthew 5, 13, Jesus Christ tells all of us, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So you are the salt of the earth, and does that mean, therefore, we should vote in elections? You know, before we jump into some facts about salt, because Mr. Robinson and I were talking earlier, trying to be professionals about all of this, I had to recollect, I have heard that argument used before. I have heard it, you know, in my misspent youth before I was in the church, uh, some Protestant uh, Christians in terms of those who profess Christianity and others saying that kind of rooting their own political activism in this idea that they are to be the salt of the earth and so I I can understand why it's a tempting question part of the basis of the claim and the question has to do with the properties of salt and mr. Robinson you were flabbergasting me with your salt <laughs> research earlier uh, could you please uh, enlighten me I was going to say insult in me, but I don't think that word exists. Insult in, would that be an I-N or an E-N? Insult, I, how would you spell that? You know when you're making up words, you spell <laughs> you it. Spell, spell yeah. it however you want. Well, that was pretty fascinating. You know, I, I, I've, every year I get older, I've come to realize how much I've taken for granted that I've lived in a modern society. Hmm. You know, I used to hear, uh, at my old job in particular, a couple older guys talk about how Growing up, they, they had an outhouse until they were such and such an age, and I, I had no idea. I had just grown up with indoor plumbing and all these things. Well, you know, part of that was I always had a refrigerator, and how you would keep and preserve food was in a refrigerator. But I don't know if our listeners know this or not, but refrigerators are a pretty new invention. And <laughs> <laughs> so a problem that historically people have had is how do you make food last more than a day or two or, or not get something in it that's going to make everybody sick? So in, in looking into salt, I, I actually did find that it was quite fascinating. And it's, salt has been used historically to preserve food over, over I, I'm not sure how long it lasts, but the method by which it does it is that salt attracts water. And so one of the things, like when you're drying, say like beef jerky or something, you know, it's dry and chewy, right. part of it is because the salt's pulled the moisture out of it. And then it's created an environment where bacteria and fungus and other pathogens can't survive in the food, or at least for a much longer uh, period of time. Hmm. But the, you know, I, in reading some of the commentaries, a number of them 
really emphasize how salt is a, a flavor enhancer, although I would argue <clears throat> that at least in biblical usage that's that's kind of a secondary idea. But the, the, what was interesting to me is that how does salt act as a flavor enhancer? Because you know you think if you add salt you're making something saltier and I, I didn't know really until pretty recently that it, it affected the way you perceive what you're eating. So for example uh, salt makes things sweeter. We talked about you know when you make chocolate chip cookies you know, there's a little bit of salt in there hmm. you know, because it makes the, the cookie taste sweeter. Uh, it reduces our perception of bitterness and it does it far more effectively than sugar. Uh, I think you had your your wife has found that salt was right helpful. She, when she was trying to eliminate uh, a lot of it. My wife doesn't eat nearly as much sugar as as I've been prone to do, but even then she was trying to remove some of the last vestiges of that. And she had seen advice that if you put just a little bit of salt in your coffee, it doesn't make the coffee taste salty. It makes it taste yeah. less bitter. And now that's actually kind of a kind of a standard for us. Well, and they and they found that it's it's more effective than sugar. I started to, I. I know some people just like sweet, but I wonder how many people put sugar in their coffee because they're trying to reduce the bitterness. And it turns out salt would actually be a little more effective at it than than the sugar is. You know, it might take a lot of sugar. Right. I appreciate you know you're talking about adding it to chocolate chip cookies. The first time I ever associated eating something salty so you could enjoy something sweet better, I was it was when I was still a high school teacher, and I thought it was. My audience is going to judge me for this, but uh, you know we learn things when we learn them. I was in the teachers' lounge and someone had mixed I can't remember like M and M's, you know, sweet chocolate M and M's along with uh, pretzels, salty mm-hmm. pretzels. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. You can't well, find those anymore. No, I know, but but it was it was a bowl mix, and someone was talking about oh yeah, the the salt and the pretzels really may, helps yep. you enjoy the M and M's. And at first I thought that was crazy. <laughs> I know, and now I sound like an idiot. I thought that was that was crazy talk. You know, I'm in my twenties. I don't. I, I you think you know the entire world, and you realize you you don't know anything, and but then I tasted it and thought, oh, this is fantastic. This, mm-hmm. this, these things really do go together perfectly. But it's not because it necessarily made it taste like a salty. It, it just made the, even the sweet, the chocolate actually, at least to me, tasted, tasted better for it. Yep. I'm all in on the uh, pretzel M&Ms. <laughs> uh, and, and then, of course, to, to round that out, uh, somehow salt makes things smell better. But it also reduces unpleasant tastes. And they still don't know how. It's just like the the, the data point is somehow reduces. It's still a mystery. Uh, you know, for our human body, we, we can't we can't live without it. Um, and a couple of things it did that I thought was interesting is it. You have to have salt to make hydrochloric acid. So even for like your digestive process, you need salt. Uh, it, pro- it promotes immune health. It it attracts water, so it helps hydrate your body and uh, helps with uh, healthy insulin levels. So. Quite, quite a few things that salt does that I never understood and, and was fascinated by. You know, that reminds me of a, a preteen camp tale. Uh, one of the preteen camps that, that I've had the privilege to run, it, it was traditionally hot. It was Missouri, and there's no air conditioning. And so it was traditionally a, a pretty hot camp. And so you're always, of course, always we recommend everyone at camp make sure they drink their water. But in particular, people would make sure there's no air conditioning, no place to be cooled. But we, we had a staff member who, in particular, uh, wanting to make sure she protected her health, uh, brought quite a bit of water. I think wore one of those camel bags, mm-hmm. those, those things, yes. and was drinking water really frequently. Well, we ended up actually uh, having a situation where she lightheaded and the rest, went to the ER. Come to find out, they said she was overhydrated. It wasn't that she was suffering from heat stroke or anything. But rather, it was all of that water, but with no salt. And so the salt levels had dropped so precipitously low that, uh, that, she, was, that she was suffering. So interestingly worried so much about, understandably worried about staying hydrated, but not recognizing that you don't just need water, you, you need that salt. And all that water without that salt uh, actually can be, can be dangerous. I think they prescribed her a banana or something with potassium, uh, which is a chemical salt oh, okay, okay. Uh, involved in salt. So. Uh, anyway, well, thank you. Uh, that's that was a fascinating report on salt. If this were a, if this were a classroom and that were your your science report, I would I would give you an A plus, Mr. Well, Robinson. If we ever go to video, I'll, I'll have like a chart and, and make a proper presentation. <laughs> that sounds that sounds great. But I, I have a voice for for audio. I saw no, the joke is you have a face. 
for audio. Right. I have a face for audio. I think our, our, <laughs> our listeners would actually agree I probably don't have a voice for audio. Okay, with that said, that's what salt is. So given how precious salt is and given how uh, it used to be, my understanding was some ancient soldiers, and if you've heard something different in all your his- history podcasting and stuff, let me know. But there were even payments that they would give people of salt. You'd actually be paid in a certain amount of salt because it was considered uh, rather valuable. And that is uh, potentially the origin of the phrase, you know, so-and-so is worth his salt. You know, they say you're worth your weight in gold. Similarly, you're saying someone's worth their salt. So when Jesus Christ said, you are the salt of the earth, uh, then that was a compliment. That was something. In fact, you, you, you had said something earlier when we were discussing this verse about the the emphasis, but I can't recall what what was that in verse 13. Something about the emphasis. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, you, you might read it, uh, you are the salt of the earth. Yeah, you are the salt of the earth, earth, right? But the commentaries bring out that the emphasis is on you. It should be you are the salt of the world. And of course, it, the, in the next verse as well, you are the light of the world. And so we probably won't get into it. These scriptures, you know, could be grouped together. But the emphasis is on you. You are the salt of the earth. So that he's not... It sounds from what you're saying that he's that Christ is not so much concerned about the condition of the world as he's he's trying to explain to Christians who they are and how they should they should see themselves. It it also seems to be not even seems to be it's it's making a distinction and I think what you could draw from that there is you my disciples and, and you know you're doing your best to follow me versus the rest of the world which is 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 missing the mark is it even trying to follow me or or following in a way that that doesn't produce any result you know. But you are the salt of the earth is an emphasis on us and, and our actions. Well, you know, that would tie in if you go back to, to Matthew 5.13. And again, there's other, there's other parallel scriptures where Christ says this. Matthew 5.13, where he read, where he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? You know, how, how do you re-salt salt? You know, I, I did read this and in, this interesting uh, take in terms of salt. Well, you know what? This kind of gets into why Christ might be saying this. I'd like to take some time to rule out why he's not saying it, but I can't help myself. I'll mention this: that how, how does salt become not salty? Because even if you drop, like you, you put it in foods and you can taste it, it does its job. You put it in water, and even though it dissolves, the water now tastes, you know, salty. So what does that actually mean? Well, well, salt can be very reactive. It can react with other things. And so it can chemically react with some things and in a sense become not salt. And it's my understanding. I could be wrong. If we have some people out there that just love mining for salt, you know, we have mine, salt mining experts, by all means, let me know. But, you know, you might need to get under a crust or something to get to the the actual salt where it's closer to the rock, you know, closer to the original source. On the outer surfaces where it makes contact with other things, that's where perhaps it could be corrupted, it could be something like, you know, where it's not really just pure salt anymore. But you can kind of get under that and get closer to the rock. You see where I'm going? Closer to the rock, yes, Mr. Yes, Robinson. Yes. Oh, look at that. Very subtle, right? Uh, then, then you're really getting to, to the good salt. But still, when it says you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? To me, if he's emphasizing you, well, you know what you are? You're the salt of the earth. But if you, as the salt, lose your flavor, how do you get seasoned again? It, and you're worthless at that point. Yeah, and that you're worthless at that point. Then really, you're no different than the dirt of the earth. You're no different than yeah. the sand of the earth. Yeah. Salt is clearly something special in a way that sand or dirt is not. Unless, Mr. Robinson, you season any of your food with dirt or sand. Not if I can avoid it. Not if you can avoid it. I did see a TV show once on people that seasoned their salads with dirt because they felt that was a good way to get healthy. Uh. It was... It, only an adventure camp where <laughs> the line between <laughs> cleanliness and and filth is is gray, and you know at a certain point, it's tough not to eat. Something it might make that, its know. way in, right? No, these are people that are actually sprinkling it like uh, croutons and stuff on their salads. But no, salt is salt, and then you have dirt, you have sand, you have these other things. And if you as Christians lose the qualities that make you so valuable. Mm-hmm. 
then what are you anymore? Right. You know, it's it's it's, all, it's like it's a call to preserve those things that make you what you are. I want to say when I had I've I've done research on this before, but it was years ago. And one of the things is like the, the chemically how does salt lose its flavor? It does it by being actually not chemically salt anymore. Hmm. Yes. Like, yes. It's yes. like it's like whatever. What, what is? I should. I probably should have put this down. <laughs> Salt's a very simple chemical compound, and when if it gets separated, and those compounds come apart. Is you don't even consider it salt anymore. So that would kind of make sense. It would be worthless and. Right. Like in the case of sodium, like sodium chloride, which is often related to, to table salt, at least, at least it once was. Who knows these days? Sodium is highly reactive to, to other things. It's just kind of desperate to engage that, that, uh, in that, that outer uh, electron shell. And that was, yeah, that was the point that if you really want to transform it, you have to chemically you know, transform. And then suddenly it's become something. It's reacted with contaminants, if you, if you will. Uh, but you keep it pure, and it's good, and it's salt, and it's good for for so many things. Now, in studying this, or, or and I would even recommend this to our listeners, especially the youth, because a very common question is how how do you study the Bible? Which is a good question. And Phil Senna had an excellent Christian Living class on that a few years ago about how you could do that. But like my question would start to become, well, how is salt used in the Bible? Like, well, what's what's this concept supposed to convey mm. to us? And, you know, we already have the idea of, of those flavors we've discussed. But in biblical usage, I found the two most common purposes of using salt as, as, a, as a, not an ale, not an, uh, uh, as a symbol, symbolically, okay. is as a preservative, which in, in biblical usage means to prevent corruption. So that, that makes sense, right? I mean, if you were putting salt in to... To preserve food for a long period of time, you're pre- trying to prevent things coming in that's mm-hmm. going to corrupt the food, make it useless. But also, salt as a purifier, it can be used as a as a cleansing agent. Uh, what did I, I mention to you? A scripture that you guys can look up if you want to. It was Ezekiel six fourteen, where God's talking about He's using the the symbol of. Uh, Israel basically as a, as a child that he found and, and saved its life but one of the things he mentions is he swaddles it and rubs it with salt which was mm. used as viewed as something of an antiseptic yeah he, he tells Israel that you know when you were there kind of you know lying in your own blood and no one was caring for you he says no one rubbed you with salt you know and no one swaddled you or anything then that kind of lack of salt was an indication of lack of care that no one was was caring for for the child. I know uh, one of my favorite verses related to salt in that sense, and I think it's related to what you're saying, is in Colossians four and verse six, where Paul is admonishing all of us: let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you know how you ought to answer each one. If you look in the context, that's where he's talking about walking in wisdom towards those who are outside of the church and handling your time well. And, you know, we live in a day and age where it seems like what's celebrated is not bothering to make sure your speech is is pure, uh, you know, and healthy in that kind of regard. In fact, the more you can pepper your pepper, look at that, it's almost like the opposite of salt, though not really. Uh, The more you can pepper your speech with things that corrupt it, well, the more enjoyable everybody seems to have or the more of a laugh that it gets right, as right. versus seeing your speech as something that you should keep clean, that should actually bring a, a proper flavor to things yep. and cause people who receive your speech, if it's well salted, that they're happy they did, you know, that there was something to it that was that was worthwhile. I'll be honest, uh, you know, being transparent about growing up and lessons I learned, I, I was the worst. I mean, I loved really? the quick and easy laugh. Mm. You know, I, you know, shame to say it now, but I was young. Uh, I was, let's just say my speech was not seasoned with salt. <laughs> and, and it's just... It, More peppered. Yeah, it's just pe- exactly. It's peppered. You know, lots of quick l- laughs and, you know, the ways you could get it in that way and, you know, inappropriate uh, humor and all those kinds of things. But the, the thing is, when I set myself to overcome and do that it was amazing how much i talked less and mm. you had to put much more effort into your conversation to make it you know edifying and and worth somebody listening to other than trying for quick quick laughs or yeah so if i gather what you're saying because it wasn't just lazy words anymore exactly. it wasn't just the words that come conveniently you know i, I don't i don't know if it's directly related but as a again in my misspent youth back when eddie murphy was king of comedians mm. Uh, used to watch his bits. I think he had specials on on a 
my cable and my mom and dad were not not as protective as they should be when it comes to television and and he would use foul language here and there in his performances and then there was one it was even advertised as I won't be the name of it or anything but it was well, his biggest performance yet and so as even as a as a young person who still didn't really know completely like what I know now about right and wrong I remember watching it being very excited about it and it it had I, even I noticed and I was I was living in a world at the time surrounded by vulgarities uh, in my home outside of my home and even I noticed well boy this is just kind of lazy you know I mean he he, he was actually swearing so much which seemed to be what they were selling it on at the time because back then that was more shocking I remember being disappointed because he just didn't seem nearly as funny. He just, it just was less thoughtful. It was less engaging, and you know, even I, even I noticed that. That yeah, when it comes to, I've seen writers who say that swear words tend to be amongst the laziest, yes. the laziest uh, of I, words. I heard a phrase recently. It was like it's the, it's the sign of a lazy and undisciplined mind. Mm. So something along those oh, lines. Oh, I've heard that one. Let's let's pretend we know exactly where we heard that, so we can feel smart. But I have heard that. Well, so we've talked about in terms of the good things that salt represents. It's used in the Bible for very positive things, and that Jesus Christ is emphasizing to Christians that they should that of all the all the material in the world, they should think of themselves as the salt. Mm-hmm. Um, but how you can't use that. I, when I, when I do try to understand what a verse says, I like to take the time often, especially if it's a verse in dispute, to understand what it does not say. And what you cannot say that this verse says is that somehow because we're salt, we should be engaging in the world and trying to change it and trying to remove from it, say purify like salt, the bad things and trying to enhance the good things because that would contradict so many other understandings. One of the verses that comes to my mind so frequently, and let me let me turn to it. You know, it's how it's funny even when we use uh, when I use my Bible on my computer, I still talk about turning to <laughs> turn to a verse. Let's, let's um, scroll to. Let's scroll to. Let's tap to. That doesn't that doesn't make any sense at all. But when Jesus was talking to Pilate after he was arrested in John chapter eighteen and verse thirty six. Uh, he has just been asked in terms of why are you here? What do you, you know? What have what have you done? And Jesus answers and says in John eighteen thirty six, "My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that they so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here." Now that said, people have tried to narrow the application of this to say, well, yeah, you know. They shouldn't have gone to war to try to rescue Jesus, uh, but that's all that really means. But is that really all he's talking about? Is he not giving something that's far more profound? He literally begins with, my kingdom is not of this world. If he just wanted to say, hey, God's plan requires me to be here at this time, but after this, you bet my servants are just going go to go to battle and go to fight all the time. He's literally starting with the premise, my kingdom is not of this world, and if it were, then my servants would would fight. You know, I think that I had a question formulating in my mind, and, and I think you've answered that, but let me ask it again anyway for, for, in the, for, for clarity. So let's say you were of the very well-intentioned person, and you're, you're, you're trying to be the salt of the earth, okay? So then answering the question, you know, well, then shouldn't we be politically active and do something to help prevent the corruption of the world like like salt would you know if i'm trying to uh, trying to think of well if i get involved in the political things i can i can be like salt because i can help prevent further corruption of the world and be a good you know mm-hmm. be that light to the world and then we mm-hmm. can be an example it's tempting to say that which is kind of at the heart of this question right but then really how far do you go with that when i when i Let's say I were to vote. Let's say uh, abortion came up for a vote, right? Maybe there was some opportunity to vote on abortion. Either abortions would become um, banned, no elective abortions in the entire United States, or they would be continue to be celebrated, you know, et cetera. Of course, who knows what the Supreme Court's going to decide on recent cases. Well, in a sense, why would I even be motivated to to vote for such a thing? Well, because I, I want the world to be a little more like what Jesus wants it to be like, right? I, I know Jesus is not going to be having uh, allowing any abortions in the millennium. Children are going to be understood as something to be celebrated and embraced. But what I'm doing 
is at even the most basic level in relation to John 18, 36, it's like I'm trying to enthrone Jesus one bit at a time. Yeah, through our effort. Through my effort, I'm trying to force him on that throne. Uh, that's because Jesus, he tells us when he's coming to do all that. He's coming at his return in the hopefully near future. That's when he's going to do those things. That's me taking upon myself to say, look, Jesus, I don't want to wait for you to show up. You know, I'm going to try to put at least your big toe, at least your thumb on the throne right now, even if it's not your time, even if you don't really want to do that. And when you do see people, and, and I admi- I'm not saying I don't admire those people. There are people out there that are definitely fighting for their convictions, that they, they believe this is wrong and they're correct in thinking that it's wrong and they're out there struggling. But when I do see them, what do I see? I see them fighting. That's what they're doing. They're mm-hmm. struggling to try to make this world better using this world's means. And we know what Jesus Christ is going to do. He's going to. We're going to be coming down on white horses, you know, with swords. Well, should we do that? Maybe should we? Should we go to arms at this time? All of that seems to contradict the very spirit of what he's saying here. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, if it were of this age, then yes, my servants would fight. They would struggle. They would try to make that so. And yet, Mr. Robinson, I would offer that in our own way we are trying to purify the world but not as the kings say of israel and such but as the prophets of old we carry the message of the way things are supposed to be we you actually made this point so well earlier when we were talking you know for our listening audience we're generally really brilliant before we turn the microphone on. So you should be aware of that. Is, this, is, is that kind of like um, quantum physics? It's <laughs> <That's> <laughs> once, right. once the audio is observed by other, it changes yes, the outcome. Yes, the observation changes the outcome. But but you you made such a, an excellent point in, in, in that regard. Uh, what was that? You're talking about, well, let's see, let's see if this helps. You know, you, you were talking about like, look how Christ returns on mm-hmm. the earth. It reminds me of something Mr. Dexter Wakefield said. Wakefield said uh, years ago in one of his sermons, which it's kind of you know in a sense people are like, well, yeah, duh, but it hit me in a certain way. And he said, uh, Christ isn't coming to reform the world; he is coming to replace it, like right. utterly. I think you said earlier something about. Um, you know, rehabilitating uh, departments and processes step by step to keep continually moving towards the kingdom that Christ wanted to make. And Christ was like, nah, we'll, right. we're, we're going to clean the slate and we're going to establish it properly with proper foundations. You know, that was something that I thought of when it comes to my wife and coffee and salt in that, yeah, my wife uh, had learned to add a little salt to her coffee to remove the bitterness mm-hmm. of the coffee. But Jesus Christ isn't just coming to remove little things out of this world. He's coming to transform this world. Yes. And adding salt to your coffee doesn't turn it into a cup of wine. It's still coffee. Uh, and, and that Jesus Christ isn't, isn't asking us to, to, to do these things. In fact, these are methods that he does not approve of. When I, when I read this, and, and, and having studied it, I, I start to settle into really the emphasis on you is is appropriate. You know we're in we're we're in the earth. We're not supposed to remove ourselves from it. And the only thing we can really control at the end of the end of the day is ourselves. So to me, being the salt of the earth comes back to me. So what does that mean? Well, I need to, you know, it goes back to the sacrificial system, frankly, which is representative of Christ. I don't know if we have time to go into that <laughs> deeply or not. But, you know, all the symbols are there. You know, unleavened bread, which means, you know, without sin. Um, the, the flour was permeated with olive oil, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And then salt in, in there is this, like, preserving agent to prevent uh, corruption from coming in. So to me, the symbolism, when you look into it and, re- and, and study it, is a focus on myself to become like that in my own life. And then when Christ comes and replaces mankind's kingdom because again we're not trying to reform it i'll be ready it can be usable right and set, and having set an example which is kind of your your point i don't look forward to the future example where the, the righteous man makes himself pray but that, <laughs> that's going to happen you know i tell you well this is we're, we're going far too far afield here i was just watching a um a gentleman who breaks down uh communication and who's good at it and who's not and he shows this two-minute jordan peterson uh 
it's not he he's on somebody else's show anyway he tells the story about the zebras and how zebras actually are camouflaged because a lion is trying to hunt the zebra but all the zebras look alike so they don't know who to who to to, to go in on mm. and so there are these uh researchers who were who were trying to study the zebras and get to know them and they were having trouble going identifying them so they tagged one of the zebras with some red paint on him and guess what lions found that zebra <laughs> and so the concept was you know when you're in a group you don't stand out if you're, you're in like in a, in a group of zebras you don't stand out but the person who like raises his head or gets marked in some way and it really did recently make me think about how here in the future as as people are more and more afraid to go against the the, the, the the theme and the narrative that's going on in the world right now. The people that stand up for the truth right. are going to suddenly be quite notable, and it's not going to be fun. You know, thank you for saying that. reminds me of the thing that you had said that I that I, I couldn't remember a while ago, which, by the way, I feel bad for that zebra. You know, it's like, hey, would you like to volunteer for an experiment? Oh, I'd love to help the cause of science. <laughs> well, you bet. So they, 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 they came to realize that the main reason the lions hunted the young or the ones that were limping, like the, the, the wounded ones, is that they could tell. That's how they could tell. They them distinguish them from yeah. the group. Exactly. Ah, that is so interesting. So, what you had said earlier was, um, you talked about, yeah, there are those seeking to change the world in these ways, whether it's voting or you know protesting, or whatever. But the that really God has asked us to have our impact in the world in, in kind of a harder way, that he's asked us to do something something harder than that. Does that sound familiar? Yes, that, yes, that... I, I know what you're talking about. Um, it even com- comes back to, uh, how, how would I term it, like uh, progressive thought. You know, let's let's go out there and do our best to clean up the climate and do all these things. Meanwhile, our personal life might be a disaster. And it's a convenient way to ignore our personal life and focus on something big picture and seem virtuous that that we're out there um, doing something about changing the world. And that made me think about here recently with, you know, I I understand the pull of of some Church of God people who want to do something and and they think well you know Absolutely. our rights are being taken away and you know what can we do about it and it really hit me that in my opinion it is much harder and we're commanded to do this we'll talk about this in another podcast coming up where we we try to answer the question what gives us the right right you know, what we, gives us the right to say all these that's things right. right why does the church get to like condemn everybody <laughs> but maybe maybe I could throw this question to to the audience frankly and you you decide for yourself what do you think is more difficult um, kind of getting involved politically and trying to make changes or being that zebra with the mark on him that's standing there telling the lions, uh, by the way, what you're doing is sinful and terrible and God hates it and we're supposed to give them a warning and hold them accountable for their sins. It'd be much easier to be in the crowd, wouldn't it? Right. See, that that was the point you made. It was zebraless earlier, yes. but it's an excellent point. That really, this idea that, well, I need to go out there, I need to, to fight to make this world better. One, Jesus Christ doesn't doesn't command us to do that, but he actually does ask us to do something that's far more, more difficult. Like, that's part of what I anticipate coming. In, in this particular world, politics has become a religion. Uh, Bill Barr mentioned that at the NRB several years ago. And increasingly, just like a lot of religions out there, one of the things I appreciate about the real faith is that we actually have room, I think, a little bit easier to to not be so condemning of people who are not a part of our faith. As, as we're, not, we're not as always concerned they're about to go to hell or this or that, and I've, I've, I've long right, appreciated right. that. But but that said, in the, in the very political faith, if you will, that exists on both sides of a lot of issues these days, almost the most offensive thing you could do is not be a part of it. Is is not take up arms right next to them to fight for the right to bear arms, you know, or to fight for the right to stick a vaccine in the face of everyone, whether they want it or not, or uh, whatever their particular side is. What they m- might be able to agree on is that who do you think you are not to be, you know, a part of all this? And yet, when you see the battles going back and forth, even if you could say legislatively force abortions to stop, first. Who wouldn't celebrate uh, people that love humanity, that God made humanity as something special? Who wouldn't be delighted to see no more abortions in the United States? I mean, we, we should be. But that said, 
the hearts of all those people have not changed. There's a harder message to give in all of this, and that's what he's asked the church to do. And it's a it's a it's a message that steps on the toes of both sides in a whole lot of these conflicts. We've been given a job to bring people to Christ, not just to try to to uh, was well, to bring people to Christ and to give a message concerning His kingdom that is coming, uh, not just try to enthrone Him bit by bit and struggle in this world. So, the fact let's try to wrap this up in some kind of way, Mr. Robinson. The fact that we're the salt of the earth is meant to speak more to what would you say to our quality as Christians in the world, would right? You? Because because to me, when I read this, the earth is already corrupted. And it's it's corrupted beyond repair. Like, you know, if you just go with the theme, we, we can't pour enough salt on the earth at this right. point to undo its corruption. It's going to take Christ to come back and do a full reset. It's that there's the great reset right there. <laughs> but you know, clearing out everything mankind has built and reestablishing it on his teachings and his doctrines. And I mean, Christ. I mean, that's one of the ways he's represented is as a cornerstone with the others that form that foundation. So, in essence. You know, it also reminds me of evil company corrupts good habits. It's, it's mm. actually in some ways a higher probability that the very corrupt world will influence us more than we're ever going to influence it, which is why we get the message out and we do our best to set the example and we do a witness to the world. But Christ ultimately is the one that has to cleanse the earth. Wow, that could be like a whole another podcast. And there's an 11 Breader coming up. So, right. yeah, that really is always the thing. What is... In fact, uh, what is it? We won't go there, and I'll get it wrong if I try to reference it. But in the prophets, where he talks about, you know, when the uh, when the holy touches the unholy, oh, right. what happens? Is the unholy suddenly made holy? It's, no, it's the other uh, way around. That's right? The one. meat in the fold. There All you right. Go. You uh, get to drop the mic this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I want to make a comment. You, you had said earlier, and I think it's good to wrap up with because I think it highlights what you're saying. You had said that when you look at Matthew 5.13, you tend to think of it in terms of Matthew 5.14 as well, and they kind of go together. And if you read them together, I think they... They, the, the message that we're talking about, it corresponds. Starting in verse 13 of Matthew 5, again, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's good for nothing. It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand. It gives light to all who are in the house. These aren't things that are actively necessarily making changes in the world, but both light in a dark world. Uh, that is seen by the world and salt that is considered something valuable. Uh, it really is more a message to Christians to be what you are supposed to be, right. not to, to join the rest, not to right. go dark and not to hide yourself, but to be visible, to be there. But you can't interpret this as some command that we are to go out into the world and actually try to to change this corrupt world using corrupt techniques and corrupt methods. Uh, I that's just you just can't get that out of this verse exactly well and and to add a little um, you know if you've ever been somewhere very very dark or maybe you lived rural enough and on a moonless night it takes very 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 little light to be noticeable in a dark place so it, it, it doesn't even have to be this like I think some people take it too far this great shining city on the hill which is a great direction to go but right now in a very dark world Christ himself in John 1 describes about a great light being seen and the world was in darkness how very you know even your one little personal example of you just doing your job um, doing your best in your marriage you know your neighbors see you dress up for church they note something and it just how very little is actually noticeable you know and when you salt your food if your salt hasn't lost its flavor you don't it takes very little. It takes very little salt to make a huge difference. Have you uh, notice once you oversalt something, there's no going back. <laughs> you, <laughs> it can't be fixed. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of the first time I tried to use a little salsa in my beans, and the kids were watching, and uh, they were real little, and I tried to pour it, and it just blopped out the whole jar, and I had essentially half salsa and half beans, and that was maybe, you know, almost 20 years ago, and the kids still talk about that. That sounds that was, pretty good, actually. It was, oh, no, it was, it was it absolutely good, awful. Not good. No, it was not. Uh, all right. Hey, I think we've covered this pretty well. You think so, Mr. Robinson? I, I feel pretty good about it. Yeah, I, I feel good enough to at least leave it in our listeners' hands and let them give us some feedback. I think once you've edited it, it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for listening, and hey, we'll see you next time. Sit there, Robinson.